Hi, I'm Connie Mandick. Welcome to this episode of Flashback, featuring my husband, Robert P. Mandick, Jr. Bob is really a true Huntington Beach native. He was born in the family home on Main Street. He attended our city schools, and he operates Mandick Motors, the business that his father started in 1939. Our entire family has been committed to public service throughout the years. I'm particularly proud of my husband's contribution to the city's governance. Bob was elected to the city council in 1978 and served until 1986. He was mayor twice in 1982 and 1986. The years he served were crucial in forming the ultimate character of Huntington Beach. Housing, and housing was booming at the time. Population was doubling and tripling. Balancing the needs of development while preserving the best of Huntington Beach meant many difficult decisions. Thank you for watching and enjoy this episode of Flashback. Reflections by Former Mayors A show that highlights past Huntington Beach mayors as they reflect back upon their term as a civic leader. This program recounts the issues these men and women face that help write the pages of history of Huntington Beach. Welcome to Reflections by Former Mayors. Hello and welcome to Reflections by Former Huntington Beach Mayors. Brought to you by the City of Huntington Beach Cable Channel 3. I'm Dr. Tom Cooper, your host for this program. It's my pleasure now to introduce to you the Honorable Past Mayor, Robert Mandick, Jr. Hi, Bob. How are you, Tom? Good to have you here today. Well, thank you. One of the things that, that I remember uh, as far as uh, uh, you uh, being involved with city council and everything was that as far as I know, and I moved to Huntington Beach in 1962, uh, but it seemed to me like you were probably the only person on the city council and person who became mayor that was born and raised in Huntington Beach, at least in the modern era. Tell me a little bit about yourself uh, as far as uh, your background and whether in fact that's true. Yes, I was born in Huntington Beach in 41 okay. and uh, of course being a native, oh, Ted Bartlett was our ambassador right mm -hmm. now and of course he's been around Huntington Beach a lot longer, of course he's a lot older, but he wasn't born in Huntington Beach. So I was probably the, the oldest native ever elected to city council and uh, it's, it's changing quite a bit and uh, I think a lot of people complain about the crowds and you should have been here in 45, 46, 47, and the 50s, and it was beautiful. And like I say, we just have to put up with the people and accommodate and condition everything that comes into town to accommodate the crowds. Uh, you went to school system then in Huntington yes, Beach? Yes, I went to the elementary school and then the high school, and I went to Loyola University after that, and I graduated from there in 63. Uh, you're married? You have yes, family? I have a daughter and, uh, of course, a wife, mm -hmm. <laughs> Connie. And uh, they've supported me through my tenure in office. And uh, cause it's actually a family type activity. It takes a lot of time from the home. And uh, if your wife and daughter participate and help along with you, it makes it much more enjoyable than if you just have to go to everything yourself and if they really enjoy it. And they, we all enjoyed it. And it was, a, it was a good experience for all of us and uh, a tremendous learning experience. When I served on the uh, Community Services or Recreation Parks Commission, that uh, Connie was quite involved in the equestrian uh, area. Yes. Uh, is she still involved in that or is your family involved in that? Well, we've had horses for approximately 20 some years oh, since my daughter was first born. She got her first pony at five and my, daughter, my wife had a horse before that and we still have horses. And one of the, basically one of the main things I'm really proud of in the city as far as my tenure on the council was the establishment of the equestrian center that's in the central park of 25 acres and uh, one thing I've, I wanted to accomplish while I was in office was to establish the equestrian community in Huntington Beach so it would be something that would be part of the community as part of the per balance of the community for a long time and with the equestrian center and of course some of the housing developments going around it uh, with bridle trails and possibility for horses on sites on lots uh, I think you'll have an equestrian community forever in Huntington Beach because of it. The, you mentioned that uh, your involvement in, in a political life was really a family 
uh, fair. How did they participate with you in, uh, let's say, in your election campaign, for example? Well, they helped me walk precincts both times I ran. Uh, my wife, a lot of times, was my sole campaign manager. And uh, the first year time out, second time out, I had uh, Fred and Lynn Boulding, which are quite well known in certain mm -hmm. areas of the city. They, they were my campaign manager along with my wife. And uh, my wife at nights would go out at 1 or 2 o'clock in the mornings on my sole, camp, or my sole sign committee. And uh, the first term, I know, the first time in office, and uh, she'd go out and put signs up all night, coming back early in the morning. And they all walked precincts with me, knocked on doors, and uh, of course just helped organize volunteers. And of course my wife had a lot of contacts, and uh, she, she has a, a lot of uh, persuasion, a lot of groups of people in town. So with her help and you know the name idea, I think has helped out an awful lot, and that's the main reason I got re you know, elected first time, then reelected the second time. You mentioned the name. The name is pretty synonymous with uh, downtown business uh, ventures here in Huntington Beach. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. What is the background of the Mandic name and the Mandic business? Well, Mandic Motors it's, in, it's a corporation, and uh, it's owned by my dad. And he's a sole stockholder, so everybody says I own part of it. I don't own a darn bit of it. I just work there. And uh, we were a Chrysler Plymouth agency since 1939, and we gave up the agency in 1965. And at that time, I know a lot of people want us to go into used car business. I don't care for selling used cars. I don't like selling cars. And uh, I think nowadays you almost have to be marginally unscrupulous to sell cars. There's so much competition, and uh, we weren't that type of dealership before, and that's one reason we didn't last with Chrysler Corporation, I believe. And so we diversified a little bit, went more in auto repairs. And my key right now, a lot of it's in towing, so I'm trying to expand that part of it. You were first elected to the city council in 1978, and that was kind of an infamous year, the year of Prop 13. What were some of the issues that were involved when you first ran for the city council? And were you involved in any kind of a, of a, a citizens group or, or committee or commission or anything like that prior to the city council? No, the only thing I was, redevelopment at that time was still a question, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, several plans of, were before the city, uh, before that time, of course, since that time, and none of them really panned out yet completely, although the downtown is in a redevelopment area. I was on a project area committee just prior to, being, to running for office. And uh, I really wasn't real happy with what I saw going on downtown. And of course, that was Prop 13 time, too. So a lot of people were afraid to touch Prop 13, but I came out and stand in favor of it. And I still think the only way to really reduce taxes is to force government to do it. And I think on its own, as I consider the bureaucracy, it's got a mind of its own. And it's very difficult to, uh, for legislators to do much about it, like we're trying to balance our federal budget. You know, I don't think they'll ever get their act together to be able to do it. I'm not sure what it's going to take to balance it. And I think local jurisdictions about the same way. Having grown up in Huntington Beach, you've had an opportunity to observe the population growth. And I remember, uh, and I've mentioned this to some people before, that when I first came into the city, I remember seeing a sign that was down on the Main Street Post Office that the population of Huntington Beach, I believe, was 12,000 in 1960. Now, when you took office, the population of Huntington Beach in 1978 was over 160,000. Right. And then we did enter into, uh, I think, somewhat of a period of, of limited growth because uh, uh, the population, as I understand it now, is somewhere in the 185,000 category. But there, for a period of time, it was growing 10 to 15,000 a year. What, what were your feelings as that was happening? Well, honestly, a lot of that time I was going to school, so I uh -huh. really wasn't that had much affinity. I did, my parents did move to Garden Grove for part of that time, so I worked down here in the summertime and on weekends all the time when I was going to school. But there's nothing you could, you couldn't change it really. The, it was a lot of us through annexation also, mm. which people don't realize. The original downtown was from about Adams South many years ago, of course, and uh, since that time, of course, we've annexed a lot of small pockets were actually separate farming communities and that's why you have a little bit of hodgepodge you have little pockets of old buildings old commercial centers that were built many years ago and of course as the city annexed those those fields obviously built up with homes and in 1978 obviously our annexation was all over so there was no rapid increase in development because there were no large parcels of land left 
And of course, the next one, of course, we'll be talking about is possibly the Balsa Chica. Now, that could give us a big shot in the arm. You're talking about 5,700 dwelling units, so that could be another 15, you know, say 10 to 15,000 people coming to the city very rapidly if that area does develop and the city annexes it. But that would probably be the next rapid increase in population. Otherwise, it's all infill right now. And of course, we're very limited in what we have left mm -hmm. to develop. You mentioned the Bolsa Chica, and uh, usually uh, I like to talk about things that people are currently involved in since they have uh, left the city council. And I know you have some involvement with the Bolsa Chica right now in a conservancy group. Why don't you tell me a little bit okay. uh, about it? I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I just, we were talking about that earlier in the program. Uh -huh. The conservancy I belong to is actually by the Santa Ana River. Oh, okay, okay, okay. It's not on that side. Okay. Although I am probably by some considered a rampant uh, environmentalist because I am quite concerned about how our coastline develops. The conservancy you're referring to is called the, Hunt or the Huntington Wetlands Conservancy. Oh, okay. And it's a small area between Santa Ana River, Brookhurst, Pacific Coast Highway, and a sanitation district, and actually the flood control channel. And what this group is doing, there's seven members on the board, and we are basically empowered by the state through the Coastal Conservancy to re develop a wetland and actually enlarge the flood control retention basin in that area. And what we're going to do, they're going to dike that whole area in, reestablish a wetland, and remove the dike as it exists now. So the channel will be widened out. And eventually there will be an outlet to the sea, a new one, for flood control purposes between Brookhurst and Santa Ana River, adjacent to the one that's there now. And it's going to actually be about 100 yards, would be kind of west, west of it. And what we're going to be doing is increasing the flood control capacity because we'll be building like a large condenser. Mm. We're going to have it diked in so when the waters do back up, instead of backing up in the channel, this wetland will be able to fill up to approximately four or five feet. And therefore, it'll help reduce the threat of floods in the, Santa, in the Talbert Valley uh, Basin, basically. How does that tie in with, or does it tie in with, the the uh, desire by the city of Costa Mesa or people in the city of Costa Mesa to have a, a harbor or an outlet, I believe, in, in the same area. No, there's on the other side. Okay. There's it between their mesa and the Santa Ana River. So oh, okay. basically it's on the east side of the Santa Ana River. Ours is strictly on the west side. Okay. And there has been some talk, I know, the Corps has, uh, since we are going to be handling this side, if they reestablish any wetlands on that side, there is some interest to possibly ta have us take over the management of those wetlands. We're strictly a nonprofit organization. We don't get paid for it. And uh, what we do, we do contract out. We do go along with the design. We're working with Caltrans, the county, the city's donated some money, and the Coastal Conservancy to reestablish that area. It's, it's, it's a very en enjoyable task. When, uh, during your term of office, uh, and also, as I recall, of course, uh, uh, this is before you were born in Huntington Beach, uh, the, uh, the Huntington Beach Pier has had some problems. Back in 1939, I believe, and then uh, while you were uh, mayor in 1983, right. and uh, then again in uh, January of 88. Uh, What's your feeling about the things that have happened with regards to the Huntington <laughs> Beach Pier? Well, Mother Nature reclaims her own whether we <laughs> like it or not. Uh, <laughs> we, I, it's tough for man, I think, to engineer anything to withstand the force of nature because there are freaky things that do happen that we cannot engineer or anticipate. And in hindsight, you know, in 83 when it, de it uh, was demolished, uh, we should have raised the whole pier. And I think before it's reestablished or rebuilt this time, uh, after the January 88 catastrophe, they're going to have to reevaluate the whole thing. And I think we have a problem. Uh, through the years, Huntington Beach, along the pier, the bottom is getting flatter and shallower. So what's happening, the waves are bre breaking out further and bigger. And uh, I think that's where a lot of our problem is, because we're getting a lot more force hitting the pier than we used to. And it's because, of, I believe, a sand buildup along the bottom of the pier, and it's getting shallower. When that happens, you're going to have that same problem. So raising it may take care of it, but I think the city should study the issue very well and uh, before they invest more money because I, I believe it's probably going to take four or five million dollars to 
make the necessary repairs to allow it to last until Mother Nature wants to take it away again. <laughs> would you speculate whether or not they should have insurance? If they can afford it, I would look uh -huh. into it and how much money we're going to have invested. But I think we have to look at the benefits of the city and the costs because sure. there's always a threat. No matter how well you build it, it could be, re, uh, you know, be damaged again, and retaken by Mother Nature. And I had a, quite a debate just not too long ago with uh, Joyce Reisner from Seal Beach, and she was saying how good her pier was and didn't get much damage in you know, January. And uh, the thing that gets me, Huntington Beach is known as the surfing capital in the world. And the only reason is because you have very consistent waves and generally bigger than other spots on the coast. And obviously, therefore, our pier takes a lot more wave action, which Seal Beach never has been that well known. And you can't tell her that, but it is a fact. <laughs> Huntington Beach gets a lot more pounding, so we have to build it that much stronger. You probably get letters from people in Seal Beach now. Oh, maybe. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that uh, the city was working on uh, and the people who were involved with recreation and parks in the city prior to the time you came on the city council was uh, Central Park and uh, the fruits of the bond issue that had been passed some eight or ten years prior to that time. Then I know that you really were involved and supportive of uh, the things that took place in the parks uh, right. system. Do uh, you have any comments or uh, any, you've already mentioned your, your role as far as the Central Park is concerned. Any other comments about the park system or your involvement there? Well, I used to think parks were, you know, necessary evil, which they are because I, if we don't preserve them now, they're, they're going to be taken up by mm -hmm. development. And I'm also on the County Harbors Beach and the Parks Commission. And we're discussing this earlier in the program, you know, before the program started. O'Neill Park is a wilderness park. And by 1990, I believe they're projecting 140,000 people around that wilderness park. And some people want to maintain the integrity of that park. Well, it's not going to happen. It's going to be impacted by people. And the same thing with ours. If we don't preserve the land now in the city of Huntington Beach, the people won't know what it was like. And 25, 30 years from now, people are going to thank the people on the council now for preserving that land. I know we catch heck now because the money being spent but I think in the long run I think it's going to be an area where no matter how much density is built it's like Central Park in New York our Central Park will be a place people can take solitude and refuge and take some get some peace of mind and a quiet walk and um, I think that's why we have to plan for the future in that respect and I think that's why parks are very important one of the things that uh, that occurred during your I believe your second term as mayor uh, was uh, riots on the beach. You remember that? And what do you remember about that? <laughs> well, I was out of town, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and when a chance I can, I, I do leave because it's, it's, I'm quite involved with the city, so I was up in the mountains and I, got, I saw it on TV, so the first thing I did was call down here and get a hold of Charles Thompson and I talked to Peter Green on the phone to find out what was going on. So there's nothing to worry about, he couldn't do anything about it. So. Um, all you, you know, I, it was only for the weekend. So I came back and basically we just tried to reevaluate what happened and uh, try to take precautions so the same episode doesn't happen again. And this course, this last year, it worked out pretty well. Mm -hmm. And I hope it continues in the future because you hate to have a few people cause problems for everybody so the majority can't really enjoy it. And I think we've taken the precautions to keep a minority out of there that will cause problems for the majority, at least I like to believe we did. And I say I think it reflected in this last uh, OP contest. It was very well run and no incidents. And I think in the future we can do the same thing. When a person is mayor, uh, as opposed to being uh, a regular member of the city council, there must be certain kinds of responsibilities or things that the mayor does. You've mentioned as we're talking here, I'm thinking, well, there, if there's a catastrophe, the mayor has to get involved in doing whatever's necessary. But I'm sure there are other kinds of working relationships that you had as mayor uh, that you probably didn't have as a regular member of the city council. Can you recall uh, what the differences might be? Well, primarily, mm -hmm. I think you're kind of the host of the city. Mm -hmm. And I think the mayor has to be more involved in public appearances. I think that's part of the job. And it's a shame in all honesty, more mayors don't take that responsibility because I think some are negligent in that respect. They are the, and when people invite the city to different functions, they like to see the mayor, and that's part of the job. 
And also, uh, getting ready for meetings takes a lot more. You have to make sure the meetings run smooth, so you have to be, have more contact with the department heads. You have to go to pre-agenda meetings, uh, make sure everything's flowing good. And basically, during the meeting, you have to listen to what everybody's saying so you can run the meeting diligently. <laughs> Otherwise, and therefore, you're actually ineffective in certain ways in your input in meetings. And I, I was kind of stymied a little bit, and it kind of bothers you because you're always honing in what everybody else is saying, and you really haven't got time to kind of sit back and analyze and gather your thoughts to make an argument for or against something that you may be for if somebody comes up with a strong argument at the last minute. So it is a handicap a little bit being there during the meetings. Mm -hmm. But like I say, it's primary, you're the host of the city, you're the main spokesperson, and I think you have to be available to the public. What were some of the highlights that you, when you look back uh, as mayor, and I know sometimes it's a little hard to distinguish between when you were mayor and when you were a member of the, the uh, city council, but uh, is there anything that particularly stands out uh, when you look back uh, of your term of offices and uh, you realize uh, you always try to figure out how qualified you are for a job mm -hmm. and everybody I've seen step in that role has come up to the job pretty darn well and it's amazing how people can adapt and I'm amazed at that because some people have really gained uh, ability by stepping into that job of people I've seen it happen to in the past and I, it's a prestigious job. Obviously, the mayor supposes you the number one citizen of the community, like you know, number one or president's number one member of the of the nation, or first person. So it's in that respect, it's a very prestigious job. And as long as you don't let it go to your head, because it's only a job, and you're only the person in that job at that time. And obviously, when you're out of it, you're just back to council member. Even a council member is a very prestigious job. But then, when you're out of the office, you like I say, you can't be overly affected with it because even though you are in that seat. You're not omnipotent. You don't know everything, and you, you've got to still listen to people and take their input and take into consideration and make decisions. A couple of things, or, or at least one that I think of that I think you were involved in was uh, uh, as a representative of the city with sister cities, Anjo and uh, uh, New Zealand. and. Uh, you, did you travel to one of those? Did you represent a city? I know you, you greeted people here. Yes, we started that, I guess in 70, no, 82. Mm -hmm. We started that in July of 82 when uh, Mayor Iwatsuki from Anjo City, our sister city, and their mayor came over here to visit us the first time to sign the papers. And in August of that same year, they invited us over there. So at that time, Don McCausser was Mayor Pro Tem and myself went over to Anjo. It was a whirlwind trip. We are only on the ground for six days. And uh, we saw an awful lot of Japan. We paid our own way, so the city didn't get stuck with the bill because we all agreed when we started the Sister City program, we didn't want the city to be out of pocket expenses. And it has got a little larger than I anticipated, but I think overall it's a very uh, proud, I don't know how to say, very well, it's a proud thing to sure. have in a city, yeah. to have a sister city. And like say, they like to come over here and we go over there. And they treat you like kings over there. If anybody has a chance to get over, they roll out the red carpet in Anjo. And they like to see visitors from Huntington Beach. Because they don't see, in the smaller cities, they don't see many uh, American citizens. And I think the whole time I was over there, six days, I only saw two uh, American citizens in the city of Anjo. So it's very unusual. and uh, it's. It's, uh, it's quite an experience, but it was very enjoyable. They yeah, asked me about international questions, and I know at that time the, the rice embargo was bothering them and everything else, so it was, you feel like a real international diplomat when you went away and went over there. So it was quite an adventure. Took a crash course in Japanese before you a left. A little bit, <laughs> not much. Were you involved in uh, the development of the cable TV in Huntington Beach? Well, most of that came about while I was on the council. Mm -hmm. But it went over several, quite a few years, so okay. I really wasn't that directly. We just made the, you know, we had staff working on it with cable systems. And it, it's come about quite a bit, and uh, I think Huntington Beach should be quite proud of it. It's working out very well, and I think we have a very informed community because of it, and the number of people we have on cable, because our council meetings and our planning commission meetings are on TV. I urge all cable, you know, any citizen to get cable, not for everything else, just to monitor what goes on in City Hall, because it's very important for local citizens to keep track of what their elected officials are doing. How about flood control? Was, uh, or, I think you were, you were involved in some of that. 83, March 83. of 83. Yes. Uh, yeah, we had some flood damage. Since that time, uh, Harriet Weeder, our supervisor, has 
taken a lot of uh, credit and uh, she's done an awful lot of work for the improvement of the Talbot Valley Channel. So it, we widened some bridges at uh, Newland. And they're going to be widening the Brookers Bridge pretty soon where it goes across <coughs> the channel. So all those areas are being done to mitigate any future flood-related problems. And I think they're working. Obviously, in this last when January, we didn't have any problems at all. So we hope it's enough. But like I said, Mother Nature gets mad enough. There's, I don't think anything man can do is going to happen. And all we can do is take as many precautions as we can, as we can afford it, basically. Too. You've been off the council now for a little over a year. And I know that you're, in, you're involved in several things. You've mentioned a couple of them. And I understand you're involved in another uh, activity, and that is uh, related to the surfing museum. Yes, Tell us a little bit about that. I'm on the board of directors of the Huntington Beach Surfing Museum, and we are trying to find a home in the downtown area. And we haven't really pinpointed an area. We're in a specific location. We'd like to be in the downtown area, the first block. I know uh, we were looking on the ocean side for a spot, we're looking for approximately 10,000 square feet. If that's not feasible, we may have to go on the inland side. So we are working quite closely with the city. Uh, we are on a fundraising campaign for that also, because we know we're going to pay for a lot of it. And we're looking for sponsors, we're looking for workers, <laughs> and we're looking for as much help as we can. And we're looking actually for uh, memorabilia. And any old surfboards, any old pictures of Huntington Beach surfing through the years, we'd like to gather anything we can to put it in a museum. We're starting to gather materials now. If a person wants to contribute either time or memorabilia, uh, they just get in contact with contact you at your business? At, yeah, yeah, my business or City Hall can give me the phone number. Okay. I didn't bring it with me tonight. I'm sorry, but uh, okay. that's one thing I slipped up on. And the okay. same with the Conservancy, if they want to volunteer. You can call my number or call City Hall and they can give you the number. And uh, we are looking for volunteers for that. And basically, current servancy, after the item is built, was where, when the uh, wetland is reestablished, is when we're going to need most of the help because we'll have to keep it clean and monitor what goes on. And right now, we are during the construction phase. We need a few volunteers for some of the cleanup, but uh, once it's established, then we're going to need volunteers for donations of money to help keep it clean and maintain it a certain amount. But the county is taking the main responsibility for maintenance of the wetlands once it's established so because it's primarily flooded part of our flood control uh, capability we've we've talked about a variety of different things and I've kind of jumped around and uh, I thought I'd give you an opportunity if there's anything that we've uh, overlooked or anything that you'd like to uh, mention in the way of reflections of uh, your uh, uh, term of mayor or city council we could uh, wrap up the program with those comments. Well, one thing I would like to talk about, we started redevelopment when I was on the council. Mm -hmm. And I've been out uh, a little over a year, and the council's about the same step they were when we first started it. And uh, I think it's gonna, it's gonna take part of the city to work in cooperation with the property owners. And you're gonna have to let the economic uh, feasibility of it work and let the the free market takes it, take its place in the role of redevelopment the downtown. I think, and we tried to force feed it too much, and I don't think you can do it. And uh, I same thing. Have people keep involved. What's happening in downtown? If you don't like what's happening, if you do, make your comments known to your elected officials. That's what they base their decisions on. So as I say, always monitor what goes on in City Hall. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you being here with us today. And thank you for letting us come into your home with this program, and a special thanks to our guest, the Honorable Past Mayor, Robert P. Mandick, Jr. This program has been produced by the City of Huntington Beach Cable Channel 3, and in the weeks to come, we'll be looking at other highlights in the lives of Huntington Beach mayors. We hope you'll join us. This is Dr. Tom Cooper bidding you a good day. <laughs>